All right, um, so I'm going to be talking about device infections here today, and I'm going to start off with a few cases. Um, I hope you all are not eating your breakfast. Some of these are not the most pleasant looking pictures. So this first case here, this was a 75-year-old male who had a pacemaker placed about five years earlier for intermittent complete heart block. And he's had three weeks of uh, pocket pacemaker pocket pain, erythema, and drainage. And you can see here, this is an outline of his pacemaker. You can see the hypervascularity and erythema here. You can actually see right here a little bit of the pacemaker generator starting to show itself. There's been some drainage coming out of it. This was a piece of gauze um, that was covering it, and you can see the drainage on there. Um, and then right down here is another little site where it's a threatened erosion and about to come out. Uh, this was a 64-year-old uh, woman who had a prior history of ventricular fibrillation, had a generator change a couple months earlier. What you're seeing here is a transesophageal echocardiogram. It's a 3D transesophageal echo, and it's really cool because right here is a vegetation. Cool to look at, not for the patient. Um, this is a vegetation that's actually sliding back and forth on the lead. That's actually pretty unusual to see something like that. Here's the level of the tricuspid valve. This is the right ventricle here, and here's an ICD lead. You can see some of the artifact from that, and here's a vegetation. Um, and so she presented with fever, chill, shortness of breath. Third one is a 64-year-old woman who had an ICD placed for primary prevention, so she never had a ventricular fibrillation event but was felt to be high risk because she had a low ejection fraction. She was on hemodialysis for end-stage renal disease and had an episode of Staph aureus bacteremia and was treated with two weeks of vancomycin. Cardiogram, looking for any vegetation, and there was none, and they felt the dialysis fistula looked okay. So got two weeks of vancomycin again, and then developed Staph bacteremia a third time. All right, please, the main take-home message from today, no matter what I'm going to tell you, is that pacemakers and ICDs save lives. Okay. We're going to be talking about one of the, the worrisome complications of them, but please don't take, don't think devices are bad. Devices are good. This is just one of the things that can uh, happen with them. So let's talk a little bit about presentation. So there's a couple different types of what you might see when we're talking about a device infection. So the first thing is superficial cellulitis, and we don't consider this a real device infection. This is usually something that's seen in the early post-op period, and it's just the skin and soft tissue, but it's not the deep tissue that we're talking about. Really, the main types of device infection are either an erosion or a threatened erosion. So this is where you're actually seeing either parts of the plastic or metal from the generator or parts of the lead, or you're about to see it, which is what a threatened erosion is, or a true pocket infection where you're seeing more inflammation at the site. You have the sort of the classics of the um, warmth, tenderness, drainage you can have also. Um, and then there's lead-associated endocarditis. So with this, the pocket may or may not look fine but there's a vegetation on the lead itself, or there's a vegetation on a valve. So if you have valvular endocarditis, by definition, the device is also infected. And then you can have unexplained recurrent bloodstream infections, so that there, um, the device itself is infected, but there's no obvious vegetation that's large enough for you to be able to see. Um, but recurrent unexplained bloodstream infection, you have to think that the device would be infected in that situation. Um, I'm not sure, it eh, actually comes across pretty well here. So um, some sort of pictures of what a pocket infection may look like. Um, so this is someone who um, presented with some tenderness at the site and just a little bit of duskiness there and, um, uh, and swelling to the site, and they ended up having a coag-negative staph infection. Then it's a little bit more obvious in some of them. So here's someone where uh, their ICD site, which you can see here, this was their incision. A lot of erythema here. Here's an area where it's actually tacked down. So the skin should be able to freely move on top of a device. And if it's tacked down, it's getting you concerned that there's an infection underlying there, especially if there's erythema at the site. Uh, this one here, it's a little bit more obvious. It's a lot of swelling there. There's more erythema and more signs of inflammation there. Then you can have something like this, which is a little bit more of a threatened erosion. Um, you get the hypervascularity in this area, a lot of thinning of the skin. And if you were to wait a couple more days, this thing would probably break through the skin. And then again, here's an evidence of actual erosion. So um, this is the header block of a pacemaker. The leads are actually plugged in underneath the skin here. And this is what we use to screw in the leads into the generator, these little white um, spots here. And then you can have different pictures for more chronic-looking infections for people who don't necessarily get their um, treatment as soon as we would like, either because of their fault or because of the cardiologist or um, internist not paying attention uh, to their site enough. And this was, you know, this is actually a couple inches thick of tissue in here, again, with evidence of erosion that we're seeing here. 
And then you have someone like this who actually spent about six months with his device outside his body, taped to his chest. Um, he was not someone who got a lot of uh, medical care uh, very often, is what I would say. Um, but the good thing is, for six months, there was actually you know no endocarditis or bacteremia, so that's good. Um, and then, uh, again, you can have lead vegetation. So this vegetation is um, more stuck on the lead. Whenever I look at this, I, I sort of looks like Snoopy to me, this picture. Um, but here, again, uh, this is a transesophageal echocardiogram. Here's the left atrium. Here's the right atrium. Here's the tricuspid valve. Um, the right ventricle is down here. The aortic valve would be in this area here. And the lead is sort of floating in through here. And here's a, just a large vegetation that's um, sitting on the lead. And you can't tell based on this image here. Um, if it's in the right atrial lead, right ventricular lead, frankly, it doesn't really matter. It's a big vegetation and needs to come out. One of the other keys, and I think this is um, even for our sort of um, critical care staff, it's an important thing to know. It's that up to 50% of patients who have a device, who have a pacer or ICD, who develop staph aureus bacteremia will develop secondary seeding of that device. So if you have a patient who's got a chronic pacemaker, they come in with staph aureus for some reason, have a high suspicion or a high concern that that device is going to become infected. And this rarely happens with non-Staph aureus organisms. Occasionally, Staph epi, you'll see it, and very, very rarely do you see it with um, uh, gram-negative uh, bugs. But Staph aureus, this is a pretty common thing. And these patient, patients can be very sick. You know, you have about a one-third chance of dying um, if you have Staph aureus um, uh, device infection uh, with bacteremia. So when we look at what the patients are that we're seeing here at UW, and this is over an 11-year time period that I looked at a couple of years ago. I haven't updated it since then. So these are not infections from our patients. These are infections almost exclusively that are referred to us from the outside. We're a, a referral center for device infections. So don't go thinking that we've had 150 infections of our patients here. Um, and just breaking it down, so about 40% or so had obvious signs of pocket inflammation. Um, uh, 30% or so had device erosion. 26% had either endocarditis or an unexplained bloodstream infection. A couple patients had a sinus tract that was connecting the skin to the device. And then a couple patients, it was an incidental finding at the time of generator change, going in into the pocket, seeing pus or other sides of uh, inflammation in the pocket at that time. One of the main predictors of what type of infection you're going to have is what the last procedure was. So this is uh, data I'm writing up right now that presented at, um, in abstract form a couple years ago. If your last procedure was an initial implantation, then you're more likely to have, have developed device endocarditis, valve vegetation, sepsis. If your last procedure was a generator change, a new lead, something where you're going into a pocket, a PACER ICD pocket that's already been formed, you're more likely to get a localized pocket infection. And exact reasons for this we're not totally sure of. One of the things that we do know is that about 40%, 50% of the time, asymptomatic patients, when you go in, you do a generator change, you culture the pocket, you do PCR of the pocket, you will find some bug that has colonized that pocket. Sometimes staph epi, sometimes it's a propionobacterium, sometimes it's other bugs that I can't pronounce. But 40 to 50% of the time, you will find that that pocket is colonized with no active evidence of infection. So the thought is that perhaps as you go into the pocket, you disrupt that symbiosis that's there um, in the pocket and that you then develop a sort of more obvious pocket infection. We do not routinely culture the pocket because we don't act on that information. Uh, so Marco Welch, who's one of the residents here, did some work with me. And one of the things that we looked at was um, the time since, uh, time since last procedure and when do they start showing symptoms of infection. So um, these were just pocket infection patients. And this is uh, days on the bottom axis here and number on the top axis. And this is, um, I think, it was about 180, 200 patients. I can't remember the exact number. And you can see that the predominance happened in the first 100 days since their last procedure. But it can go out a long period of time. And some of these patients are seeing 10, 15, even 20 years since they last had their device touched. So that 20 years is people who have really great batteries or who just had abandoned systems because it was felt they didn't need the system anymore. Um, but you can see pocket infections years later and not necessarily in this early pre-op period. We talk about that the highest risk is in the six-month window um, after the device is um, uh, manipulated, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a bit, but I think the issue is there's no clean time window. There's no time where you can say, all right, look, I'm not worried about this patient. 
Looking at what the bugs are that we're seeing, this is, again, data that um, we see, saw here at UW. And the predominance is coag-negative staph. About 40% of the time, uh, the bacteria we're seeing is coag-negative staph. 25% of the time, uh, we're seeing staph aureus with a, sort of some MRSA, a uh, little bit more MSSA. And again, this is not the bugs from our institution. This is the western Washington area. A little bit of mycobacterium, candida, a little gram-negative, some polymicrobial. And about 14% of the time, we're gram-negative, and this, actually, culture-negative. And this is something that's been repeated uh, from a lot of different uh, centers. Either people are started on antibiotics ahead of time, and so by the time you get in in culture, you're not um, able to grow anything, or for whatever other reason, we're just not um, uh, able to grow out uh, any organisms. For most of those people, I'll tell you, we um, just put them on vancomycin, and they seem to do fine. So whatever it is, um, either the removal of the device system um, that we'll talk about or the antibiotics is getting the job done. So what are the rates of device infection? So um, uh, Jeannie Poole and I did a review article a couple of years ago where we, uh, this is one of the things we looked at. And there's a wide range. It's somewhere between 0.3 and 8% of the time the devices uh, become infected. And it's, it's difficult, difficult to know exactly what, uh, sort of what the exact number is based on these studies because there's a lot of variability. Do you include pacers and ICDs or do you look at them separately? Some studies included superficial cellulitis, which is not really a device infection. Length of follow-up is variable. Where the, the generator is located, if it's in the belly versus the pectoral area. We know the abdomen has a higher rate of device infections versus um, in the pectoral area. We don't do very many abdominal generators nowadays. Um, if it's transvenous epicardi or epicardial leads, if they're having uh, cardiac surgery done at the same time. So I think there's, we don't have a good answer based on those studies. What we do know is that the device infection rates, though, are increasing over time. So one study here, they looked at throughout the 1990s, the bottom line here, which barely increases, was the rate of endocarditis, so valvular endocarditis over this time window, which went up a little bit, but not very large, versus a true device infection, which actually increased significantly over that 1990s. Another study taking a little bit of the similar window, but a different data set, they were looking at, in the blue here, the rate of device implantation, which went up over time, um, but the rate of device infection was outpacing the rate of device implantation. Another study here from Arnie Greenspan uh, at Thomas Jefferson, they looked at the National Hospital Discharge Survey. Again, the rate of device imp uh, implantation did go up over time. The red line here is the overall number of devices. Um, we use this term CIED, cardiovascular implantable electronic device. Uh, but the total number of devices went up over time. Paces are a little bit, ICDs went up a lot. Um, but the device infection rate was, for their data set, was relatively constant through the 90s. And then in around 2004, started to see this sharp increase in device infection rates. And what they were able to do was then look at sort of broad categories of comorbidities, renal failure, heart failure, diabetes, respiratory failure. So all of these um, risk factors were coincident with this increase in device infection. So the thought is we're putting devices in sicker patients who are more likely to develop an infection. And there's significant financial costs associated with this. The average length of stay for device infection for any intern who's ever been on Cards A would know that these patients can sit there for weeks at a time, um, somewhere between 8 to 20 days on average, with um, costs ranging from twenty-five dollars to $150,000. Depends if you include the implantation of a new device or not in that number to sort of get your, um, your numbers here. But you can see that the costs have gone up over time. So getting into then a study that I did um, looking at the ICD registry, and this I presented to Heart Rhythm Society a couple months ago, and I, the paper has been under review at a journal for several months now, and I'm waiting for them to tell me if it's accepted or not, so I, I don't have a reference for this exactly yet. Um, but the point of what the study that I did was trying to figure out in a large Medicare population what is a little bit more accurate rate of ICD infection. So I, this is just an ICD population. It's not a PACER population describing a little bit more about the time to infection, and then getting a better sense of the risk factors for infection in a, a large, large data set. So this is actually two data sets that we used. One of these was the Medicare Claims Database, and the second was the ICD Registry. Now, I don't know if you guys know about the ICD Registry. This is a national um, database. It was cr created in response to the CMS, uh, CMS mandate back in 2005, but it started enrolling patients in 2006. Uh, it's currently run by the American College of Cardiology. 
all Medicare patients in the United States who get a primary prevention ICD are enrolled in this database. Most non-Medicare patients are put in, most secondary prevention patients are put in. So primary prevention is someone who's never had a ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia arrest. Secondary prevention is they've had one. The primary prevention patients are felt to be high risk to develop uh, one of these. Uh, the way we do, here, do it here at our institution, um, putting people into the registry is at the time of implant, um, the nurses are putting in the information into the database while we're doing our implantation. And it has information about the device, it has information about the patient, the hospital, um, has EKG information, has echo information, has lab studies, blood pressure, um, uh, probably got 100 or so different characteristics um, uh, and different factors that are in this database. So the way that we did this is ICD infections were defined or identified using the Medicare claims data. So we looked in the Medicare data set within six months of hospital discharge after an ICD implantation. I would have loved if we had a longer period of follow-up, but because of some rules that the um, registry in, in imposed on us, we only had six months follow-up. And we looked in the Medicare claims data for a ICD-9 code for a diagnosis of ICD infection, which is its own uh, code, 996.61, or infective endocarditis. So as we said, anybody who has an endocarditis and has a device, they have a device infection. We also followed a pattern or um, a methodology that had been used by some other investigators. We were concerned that there'd be some undercoding and people wouldn't um, have the right uh, ICD-9 code for this. So we also used procedural codes for a ICD implant, a pacemaker or ICD removal, or a lead removal if they also had, during that same hospitalization, sepsis, bacteremia, cellulitis, or fever. So if someone had bacteremia and a pacemaker removal, the thought was that most likely they also had the definite, they also had a device infection, it just wasn't coded appropriately. So then, with this information of the Medicare data set of some patients, we're able then to link that with the ICD uh, registry data. So again, from the registry, we get some of these patient and other characteristics. There's no direct matching between the two. There's um, legal requirements that the ACC has um, with um, that it, they had set up with hospitals that there would be no direct linking, so no direct identification of patients. So this is all indirect matching. So they were, um, some of my colleagues at Yale, what they were able to do was match by age, gender, admission date, ICD procedure date, uh, and provider number, about 70% of the Medicare patients with ICD registry. So what this means is about 70% of patients in the registry are Medicare. 70% of those have been linked with the ICD registry. So we're talking about a data set that has about 50% of all the ICDs placed in the United States for this four-year time window of 2006 to 2009 that we were able to look at. So with this, we had 200,000 patients that we were examining. And our overall infection rate in that first six months was 1.7%. There are a little bit over 3,000 patients um, identified with this approach. And this fits within the numbers of what we've seen, and it fits with some other large data sets um, studies. Similar to what other studies have shown, the more leads you put in, the increased chance there is that someone will develop an infection. So single chamber devices, 1.4%. Dual chamber devices, 1.5%. Biventricular devices, someone who has three leads, has a higher rate at 2%, 2.0. Similar to what's also been seen, if it's an initial ICD implant, first time you're putting a device in, the infection rate is lower versus if you're going in a second time for a generator change or a new lead, 1.6 versus 1.9%. So time to ICD infection, and I don't really like the way that this um, figure is, but this is um, survival free of a device infection. So um, what you can see is that in the first 45 days or so, you have a little bit of a steeper slope, and then it settles off about 45 days, and you have a, a less steep slope. But by six months, it's not a plateau, and it still keeps going. And we don't exactly know what that curve or line looks like going forward. Um, but the rate, we're not getting the full rate. 1.7% is going to be a minimum rate that we're looking at. Then uh, using a multivariable analysis and trying to figure out what the predictors are, I'm skipping out the univariate analysis here for time. Um, and I'm going to show you about the top 12 or so um, risk factors or um, things that increase the odds. So adverse event at the time of implant was by far the most or the factor that most increased your risk of developing an infection. 
but I'm going to get into that uh, in a bit. Um, but that's the only one that had an odds ratio over two, about 2.5 or so. Prior valve surgery was the second most common. So these are people who are having, you know, usually they have prosthetic valves. Um, so they're going to be at an increased risk of developing an infection anyway. I don't think this is a big surprise. Uh, and the number three was reimplantation. So again, this concept of if you're going into a pocket another time, there's an increased rate. And what was interesting was that the predominance of this is actually patients who are going for an upgrade. So you're putting in a new lead, increased the rate versus generator change. We actually, the odds ratio here crosses the one line. So going into a pocket um, uh, earlier than a battery change seems to increase the rate. So dialysis, end-stage renal disease patients on dialysis, um, this isn't surprising. They're getting more vascular access, alterations of innate immunity. Um, again, more leads. So CRT, cardiac resynchronization therapy, or a biventricular device, is going to increase your rate. Also, hospital capabilities. So if our reference group here is a hospital that has uh, availability of both bypass surgery and coronary angiography, those who don't have availability of bypass surgery or um, bypass surgery or coronary angiography had a higher rate. So we don't have a lot of information about the hospitals, but this gives us a little bit of sense about the capability of a hospital. Other things, so race. So black, non-Hispanics, and Hispanics have a, uh, increased odds. Lung disease, they have an increased odds. Sodium level, so hyponatremia um, is seen, and I, I can't, I don't quite know what this is. This may be a marker of severity of heart failure. The more severe heart failure you have, you can have hyponatremia, so it may be a marker of that. Um, operator training. So if you were a board-certified EP like I am, I have a lower odds of infection compared to non-board-certified EPs. And then cerebrovascular disease. Um, and I'll just note here the C statistic for our model is 0.61. So that's pretty low. It's not a great model, even though we had a you know, hundred different factors that we could um, put into this. So adverse events. So of people who developed an infection, 5.4% had an adverse event at the time of implant. And what we're really talking about here is a hematoma at the pocket or a lead dislodgement. Hematoma is defined in this data set as either needing to go into the pocket to evacuate it, so you have a big amount of blood in there and you have some concern for whatever reason and you go in and you evacuate that blood, or that you need a blood transfusion. And I'd say the need for blood transfusion is likely very low in this. The second would be lead dislodgement, lead dislodgement being defined as you need to go back into the pocket to reposition a lead. Hemothorax, AV fistula, those were also statistically significant, but I think the numbers are so small that I don't really make much of it. I'm just throwing in pneumothorax and pericardial tamponade up there. Those are two of our more um, frequent um, complications that can be seen, but they had no influence on this. Mortality. So uh, people who develop a device infection have about twice the mortality people who do, don't develop device infection, whether that's due to the infection, which plays into it, or the comorbidities that patients have. Um, we can't exactly uh, say with this. So then we try to create this risk model. We try to come up with a sort of CHADS2 score or something that could predict device infection. And then you would have someone that you saw in the clinic and you would put in their their characteristics in this model and you would say, all right, look, their risk of device infection is so high that we probably shouldn't do it because they're going to have a complication. They're not going to benefit from it. We purposely left out adverse events at the time of implant because we wanted it to be used in the clinic setting. And we also left out hospital and operator characteristics because we didn't think it would be used necessarily if we included those. So if I'm sitting there and or someone else, let's say, is sitting there in the clinic and they put in their information and they say, oh, look, my risk of infection is 3%. But if you go to that guy down the road who's EP board certified, it's 1%. Um, so no one's really going to use it if we included that information. So we came up with all these complicated points that you can see here. And then um, we looked at this and we said, all right, look, if you have a very low point, um, you have a lower risk of infection. If you have more point, you have a higher risk of infection. And we have a derivation cohort and a validation cohort. And then we realized this just isn't very useful. The lowest risk group is 1%. The highest risk group is about 3%. Even if someone has a 3% chance of infection, I'm still going to implant their device. Um, it's not something I would ever use clinically. So we sort of said, oh, this is really interesting. And then we threw it out and are not really including it for anything. So the limitations of this study that we're doing is we're using administrative codes to define infection. We're using ICD-9 codes. We don't have patient-level data. There's been some um, 
quality control of the um, ICD registry where they've done some direct looking at charts in a small number of patients, and it looks to be relatively accurate. But we, we understand that there are some limitations involved with that. And also, this is only six-month follow-up. And these are minimum infection rates. We know the number is going to be higher. It's not going to be 15%. I'm not saying something like that. But I think you know, it's probably going to be a rate of 2 to you know 2.5%, somewhere in that range. And we only have certain variables in the registry. Um, and this is also version one of the registry. So about 2009, 2010, they switched to a second version. So in version one, we have medications like warfarin use, which was, I should say, weekly positive in this. In version two, we have INR at the time of implant. So we have a little bit more information in the second version of the registry that hopefully at some point I'll be able to look at. Um, but we also don't have things like fever at the time of implant or active infection at the time of implant. There's been a few other studies that have shown in single center studies, if you implant a device in someone who has a fever, that there's a higher risk that they're going to get a device infection, probably because they have an infection somewhere else. Um, and I'll say we in the EP service can anger a lot of people in the hospital when um, they say, all right, can you put the pacemaker in today? And we say, oh, they developed a fever last night. I'm sorry, we can't. And then they're like, oh, come on, just put it in. And we say, no. Um, and then lastly, these are just Medicare patients. So it doesn't apply to younger patients, doesn't apply to patients with uh, commercial insurance. So in conclusion with this data set, um, what we can say is, you know, this is actually the largest data set of ICD infections. Um, and 1.7% have an infection rate of uh, six months. And the infection rates are influenced, uh, the, by far the number one thing is by early reoperation. So if you were going in earlier than the time of generator change, that is the thing that is going to most increase your risk. So either a complication with hematoma or lead dislodgement or an upgrade of putting in new leads. Prosthetic valves increase your risk. Biventricular devices increase the risk. Increased comorbidities like hemodialysis and hospital and operator characteristics can influence the risk. And I think really the implication of this is we really need to do everything we can as an EP community to be avoiding early reoperation. So if someone develops a hematoma, we don't go back in. We try and manage it conservatively, which is what our practice has been here. And during the procedure itself, we try and do things to prevent the hematoma from happening. So if we can stop clopidogrel, which is really our big drug that we hate, um, we'll try and do that ahead of time. We usually can't stop them in our patients because they've had recent stents. But if we can do something like that, clopidogrel is worse than warfarin for bleeding in our patient population. Um, things like you know, just using good sterile um, surgical technique it's a good idea. Try and be sure our leads don't dislodge. And then really sort of determine the appropriate time if you need to upgrade someone when that is, um, and even if it is the right decision for that patient. And I think the other take home is that the predictors of infection that we have only weakly predict infection, and that there are unmeasured clinical and procedural characteristics that can influence risk, and we don't really exactly know what those are, or at least we're not capturing in the data set that we have. All right. So now getting back into sort of the um, sort of what to do. So workup and treatment. So if you have someone who's got a suspected device infection, what should you do? Well, check at least two blood, two blood cultures. So even if someone just has an erosion or a localized pocket infection, they can have bacteremia. Check blood cultures. Also, don't aspirate the pocket. Don't stick a needle in it. If you see someone who's got a big pocket, don't stick a needle in it. Number one, if it looks red and infected, we're going to be going in anyway and removing the device and removing the tissue and cleaning things out. We're going to be getting a much better culture than you are with a, a needle as you stick in it. Number two, if it's not infected, now you could be introducing infection into it. Number three is you don't know what's in that pocket. So if you stick a needle in and there's a lead there, you can damage that lead. So let's say someone has an ICD and you do something like this and you damage that lead, now the device may think that they're in ventricular fibrillation and they may get shocked. So that's bad. Or if they have a pacer and they're pacer dependent, they have complete heart block, the pacer may stop working and they may have asystole. So don't stick a needle in the pocket. Everybody should get a transthoracic echocardiogram. We usually do a TEE if there's bacteremia or if there's been antibiotics that are given prior to blood cultures is the recommendations. Um, and then we always go in and remove these devices. So at that time, we're doing a gram stain and culture of everything. So we do a swab. We take out the tissue that's in there. We take out the leads, and we're culturing those. That's really where we get um, much more information. Sometimes people who have a little bit of a questionable diagnosis of a device infection, you can use um, FDG PET-CT. We've used this a couple times at our institution, and this is just an example from a, a paper where they, here's a CT, um, you can see the device, here's the part of the lead, um, 
here's a lead in the heart. You can see that uh, it's lighting up here on our PET CT, uh, indicating that this person has a device infection, this person doesn't have a device infection. Um, so there are guidelines, or at least a scientific statement that's come out from this. Um, all patients who have a device infection, pocket infection, lead endocarditis, erosion, all these patients should have complete system removal. This means removing the generator, removing the leads, removing any tissue that you can reach in the pocket. All patients with valvular endocarditis should have complete system removal. So if someone has mitral valve endocarditis, they should still have their whole system removed. Patients with occult gram-positive bacteremia should have complete system removal also. Um, in my mind, I usually don't think about this for one episode. I usually would like someone to have a recurrent episode, um, but if we really have no other source, we've removed the device in some patients. And then persistent occult gram-negative bacteremia. Um, the first three are a um, class one recommendation, so you should do it. The um, gram-negative bacteremia, it's a class 2A, so it's reasonable to remove the system. So one of the questions is, you know, well, if the guidelines say that you should remove the PACER and ICD in all patients who have a, even a pocket infection, assuming that they have reasonable comorbidities, you know, why do you extract if the infection is only at the pocket? If it's only up here, why do you have to take out the leads also? Um, and the issue is because it's not just up in the pocket. The bacteria and our ID colleagues can say a lot more about this than I can. They translocate down the lead. Um, so here's just some electron micrographs of um, leads that have been infected um, with just pocket infection. And on the left here, you can see coding of um, this is a Staph aureus patient. This is Staph epi. Um, <clears throat> and so you need to remove the whole system. There's been a lot of cases of patients or people where you just sort of remove stuff up here and leave the leads alone. And then they develop either a recurrent pocket infection or they develop endocarditis at a later time. Um, and I think this is actually a, a really great study of pushing 10 years or so uh, now from out of France. And what they did was they had patients who just had pocket infection, and all four of these categories are essentially the same thing. They shouldn't have broken them up into columns. So patients who have a pocket infection, they went up and they removed the generator and they removed the parts of the lead that they could reach from up above. And then they went down to the groin area and they put in a sheath, a big IV in the femoral vein, and then put a snare up into the heart and grab the leads and remove them by snaring them and pulling them out through the femoral vein. This way, the thought was, you're not going to get cross-contamination of pulling a lead out from up above, and you can try and get more clean cultures of those leads when you pull it out from the groin area. Uh, and the sort of upper line here is the parts of the lead that they cultured that were up in the pocket itself. You know, almost 90 to 100 percent of the time, they're getting positive cultures. And the parts of the leads that were just in the bloodstream alone, 75, 80% of the time, they were able to culture something. So this really shows that what we think of as just pocket infections are not just pocket infections. It's really the entire lead and the entire system um, that has the infection. And this is just three separate studies that looked at um, what happens when you do complete system removal in terms of the recurrence rate, which is 0 to 1% versus you do a sort of partial system removal or you leave it alone and your recurrence rate is 50 to 100%. So it's obvious you really need to remove the whole system. And it's not just sort of recurrence rates, there's um, also mortality data. This is a JAMA paper from last year that was a big data set of endocarditis patients. And the mortality is better in those, or survival is better, I should say, in those who have device removal versus not device removal. Um, and this is whether there's a concomitant valve infection um, or just a, uh, a lead infection. The issue is that leads, when they're put in, are not so simple to remove. You can't just pull them out. They're scar tissue. So this is from an autopsy specimen, obviously, of someone who has um, a pacer system in place. Um, we're looking at the right atrium here. The tricuspid valve is down below. The SVC is here up above. And what you can see with these leads is that there's scar tissue down here. There's scar tissue down here. There's scar tissue where this lead tip is uh, implanted. So you can't just pull it out. The main way that we use this is with an eczema laser system. So there's a laser that goes, um, tracks over the lead. So the lead is going through the laser. The laser actually shoots out just a, a few nanometers, essentially, to try and vaporize this scar tissue. And it works pretty well to get these leads out. The issue is that leads are designed to be put in. They're not designed to be removed. They're doing a better job with this nowadays with their lead design. 
Um, this was another sheet that, that we used to remove this, but you can see how this lead here is just completely unraveled as we've tried to remove it, and you're sort of pulling on wire to try and get it out. Um, here's another example of a patient. There's all this scar tissue in place um, uh, that we had to, to free up to be able to get these leads out. One of the questions is the way, or one of the issues, the way we do this is we do this all percutaneously. So we're doing this all from the device site. We have a pretty good success rate, 95% or higher in terms of removing these leads with a relatively low complication rate, about a 1% chance of someone needing an emergent sternotomy. Um, but there are some patients who we will send primarily for surgery. Uh, and so this is data I presented earlier this year of a large data set of about 400 patients um, who had device infection. And about 9% ended up going for a surgical extraction. Some of these are people who had failed percutaneous extraction, so we couldn't get it out. Um, but in general, these are people who have larger vegetations. There's some vegetation size where we say, look, this is too big and we're concerned about a significant pulmonary embolus. So if someone has a vegetation that's five millimeters, 10 millimeters, that vegetation is going to go to the lungs, but it's not going to cause a clinically significant pulmonary embolus. But you reach some time, some size, three centimeters, two and a half centimeters, three and a half centimeters, where you're worried that it's going to stick even in like the pulmonary valve or the RV outflow tract. So if you have a really big and globular vegetation, we might be concerned about trying to remove that percutaneously. If it's more filamentous, we might feel more comfortable doing it. Um, but the patients who go for surgery typically have larger vegetations, are more likely to have endocarditis versus a, a pocket infection, more likely to have had embolic events, um, and are healthier in general. They have a lower Charleston comorbidity index. Um, usually our surgeons would say, gosh, they're too sick, and you know, they're going to have a higher risk of perioperative events, so they would um, try and push us to uh, remove the device. All right, after extraction, what do you do? There's a whole flow chart you can see here. But assuming we remove the device, in general, patients get antibiotics for 10 to 14 days afterwards. Uh, if it's just a pocket infection, uh, depending if it's a lead infection or valve infection, you're usually talking about two to six weeks that we'll do antibiotics. Um, so the question is, let's say you have someone who's pacemaker dependent and you remove their pacemaker. What do you do for them because they need a temporary pacemaker? And typically in the past, what was done was you would put in a balloon catheter and put a temporary pacemaker in and the patient sits in the ICU for that time period and they can't get out of bed because you're worried about the, dislodging that pacemaker. Um, but what we use is we either call them externalized pacemakers or temporary permanent pacemakers. We take a real pacemaker generator and we might take the patient's actual pacemaker that they had or we have some that we've sterilized and reused and put in a new pacemaker lead and then it comes out the right IJ and we attach it to a pacemaker generator. And this way, for a short period of time, and we've done this up to six weeks for our patients, they don't need to be in the ICU. They can be on the floor. We've had the occasional patient even go home with something like this. So it provides a lot more freedom and mobility for patients. Um, and it really is a nice option that we're able to offer. If you have someone who needs a defibrillator, doesn't need a pacer, and they want to get out of the hospital, there's this life vest, which some of you may or may not have seen, which is a wearable defibrillator. So it's a vest. They have um, a patch on the back that it can shock from. There's another patch here that it can shock from. And then this is the um, sort of battery and brains of the system that they wear on their waist or wear over a strap. Um, the thing about this system is you need to actually wear it. So if you're not wearing it, it doesn't do anything. And it's actually really sad. We had a patient who had a life vest and didn't have it on at the time and, and ended up dying uh, because they weren't wearing it um, and had a, what it's a presumed VF event. Um, then you have to put a new device in. And so when we put in a new device in, we're usually waiting somewhere from three days to two weeks um, and even up to six weeks in some patients. We always go over to the other side, so we're not going to put a new device in in a spot that was previously infected. Uh, some of you may have seen these new subcutaneous ICDs. So if a patient needs an ICD, this is a new option that we have, and especially for our infection patients, I think this is a great option. So the traditional ICD goes in the left pectoral or right pectoral area. There's a lead that goes into one of the subclavian veins and then goes into the heart. The sub-Q ICD stays completely outside the bloodstream. So with this system, the generator goes um, in the fifth to sixth intercostal space underneath the axilla. So it's not in the armpit, it's below the armpit. The lead is tunneled subcutaneously. It's outside the thorax, and it goes, you can see here, sort of along the thorax, and then it goes parallel to the sternum, the lead. You can actually go on the right side also. And then it shocks from this coil here right next to the sternum to the generator, or from the generator to the coil. So this is not in the bloodstream. 
So if you have someone who's at risk for endocarditis, this is going to be a much better option for them. All right. So finishing up here, getting back to our three cases from the beginning. So our 75-year-old male who had his pacer placed for intermittent heart block with this ugly-looking pocket. So he was extracted. He was reimplanted three days later on the other side uh, and got two weeks of antibiotics and did well. Our second patient here who had this um, veg that was sliding along the lead, we were concerned with this person. It was a pretty large vegetation. We were worried about the risks of a significant pulmonary embolism. So this woman actually went to the operating room, and you can see here, here's the lead. Um, here's the ICD coil portion of it, and here's this vegetation that was sliding up and down along the lead. Um, I think it's a great echo pathology correlation, really showing that you can – echo does a really good job of showing shapes and things like that. Um, so this person ended up uh, uh, getting a um, – uh, getting antibiotics for a few weeks and um, actually tr still trying to put a new sub-Q ICD in her. We've had some issues. And then the third one, this 64-year-old who had recurrent back Staph aureus bacteremia. So she was extracted, got antibiotics. Um, the cultures um, of the system itself, the lead itself, actually grew out Staph aureus also. And the decision was made in this patient not to reimplant. Um, and I think that's actually a really important concept to understand is 25-ish percent of the time that a patient gets a device extracted, we don't reimplant. And that may be because they don't have the indication anymore. Maybe they had heart block after surgery and um, their AV node got better and so they don't need a pacer anymore. Or they had an ICD placed for primary prevention but their heart failure improved and so they don't need a device anymore. So we don't necessarily reimplant everybody. Sorry, in conclusion. All right, pacers and ICDs save lives. It's the most important thing, please take that away. Um, but device infection rates are rising, um, and it can either be a pocket infection or endocarditis or occult bacteremia, and we're, we're really trying to still figure out what these risk factors are, but we know that early reoperation is bad. That's, I think, the, the big thing that we've learned. If someone has an infection, you need to extract all hardware, including any leads, any leads that are being used, any leads that aren't being used anymore and have been abandoned. And then you really have to carefully consider the need for reimplantation at a later date. Not everyone needs to be reimplanted. So, thank you very much.